Good evening. Welcome to Emmanuel this evening as we commemorate Ash Wednesday, the beginning of our Lenten journey, 40 days uh, through the wilderness, as it were, as we remember our sin, we repent and turn to our Lord with contrition and with faith in his promises, uh, and knowing that we, at the end, do not stay, of course, at Good Friday, but we are brought through to Easter Sunday, the resurrection and life everlasting. This evening, we'll be using two orders of service. Uh, near the beginning of the service, we'll be praying together the litany. This will be our main prayer today. That's on page 288. <clears throat> After the sermon, we'll be using the service of corporate confession and absolution in preparation to receive the Lord's Supper. Following the litany this evening, uh, there will be an opportunity uh, for the imposition of ashes. So if you would like to receive a ashen cross on your forehead. Uh, we'll have some time for that following the litany, and I'll invite you forward and you can form a line one by one. I should also mention, too, that the sermons uh, for our Lenten meditations this year uh, were originally, the thoughts were originally penned by uh, Pastor Jeff Gibbs, who is at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, and they take us through Luke chapters 22 and 23, so the passion narrative of our Lord Jesus Christ uh, in Luke's Gospel. And it's based on something that Joseph said in Genesis chapter 50, which is, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Remember the story of Joseph where he was sold into slavery and his brothers later in life were scared that Joseph was going to take revenge. Uh, but Joseph puts it all into perspective that God is, in fact, the author of all life and of all time and space. And although he is not the one who started evil or who does evil, he uses all of these things brings them together for his purposes, uh, both for Joseph and ultimately for all of us in Jesus Christ. We'll begin this evening with our opening hymn, which is number 436, Go to Dark Gethsemane. <laughs> service this evening begins with the invocation and a short opening address 
and then we will pray together the litany on page 288. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters of our Lord Jesus Christ, on this day, the Church begins a holy season of prayerful and penitential reflection. Our attention is especially directed to the holy sufferings and death of our Lord Jesus Christ. From ancient times, the season of Lent has been kept as a time of special devotion, self-denial, and humble repentance born of a faithful heart that dwells confidently on God's word and draws from it life and hope. Let us pray then that our dear Father in heaven, for the sake of his beloved Son, and in the power of his Holy Spirit, might richly bless this Lenten tide for us, so that we may come to Easter with glad hearts and keep that feast in sincerity and truth. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, hear us. God the Father in heaven, have mercy. God the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy. God the Holy Spirit, have mercy. Be gracious to us. Spare us, good Lord. Be gracious to us. Help us, good Lord. From all sin, from all error, from all evil, from the crafts and assaults of the devil, from sudden and evil death, from pestilence and famine, from war and bloodshed, from sedition and from rebellion, from lightning and tempest, from all calamity by fire and water, and from everlasting death, good Lord, deliver us. By the mystery of your holy incarnation, by your holy nativity, by your baptism, fasting, and temptation, by your agony and bloody sweat, by your cross and passion, by your precious death and burial, by your glorious resurrection and ascension, and by the coming of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. Help us, good Lord. In all time of our tribulation, in all time of our prosperity, in the hour of death, and in the day of judgment. Help us, good Lord. We, poor sinners, implore you, to hear us, O Lord, to rule and govern your holy Christian church, to preserve all pastors and ministers of your church in the true knowledge and understanding of your wholesome word, and to sustain them in holy living, to put an end to all schisms and causes of offense, to bring into the way of truth all who have erred and are deceived, to beat down Satan under our feet, to send faithful laborers into your harvest, and to accompany your word with your grace and spirit. We implore you to hear us, good Lord, to raise those who fall and to strengthen those who stand and to comfort and help the weak-hearted and the distressed. We implore you to hear us, good Lord, to give to all peoples concord and peace, to preserve our land from discord and strife, to give our country your protection at every time of need, to direct and defend our president and all in authority, to bless and protect our magistrates and all our people, <clears throat> to watch over and help all who are in danger, necessity, and tribulation, to protect and guide all who travel, to grant all women with child and all mothers with infant children increasing happiness in their blessings, to defend all orphans and widows and provide for them, to strengthen and keep all sick persons and young children, to free those in bondage, and to have mercy on us all. We implore you to hear us, good Lord, to forgive our enemies, persecutors, and slanderers, and to turn their hearts, to give and preserve for our use the kindly fruits of the earth, and graciously to hear our prayers. We implore you to hear us, good Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, we implore you to hear us. Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy. Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Grant us your peace. O Christ, hear us. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. Amen. 
Congregation may be seated. Those who wish to come forward for the imposition, imposition of ashes may do so at this time.
The Old Testament reading this evening comes from Genesis chapter 50. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, It may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph, saying, Your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, Please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin, because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph went, wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear, I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. So Joseph remained in Egypt, he and his father's house. Joseph lived 110 years. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation. The children also of Machir, the son of Manasseh, were counted as Joseph's own. Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died, being 110 years old. They embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle reading is from Romans chapter 8. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grow inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 22nd chapter. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread drew near, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to put him to death, for they feared the people. Then Satan entered into Judas, called Iscariot, who was, one of, the, who was of the number of the twelve. He went away and conferred with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. So he consented and sought an opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of a crowd. Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat it. They said to him, Where will you have us prepare it? He said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters, and tell the master of the house, the teacher says to you, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished. Prepare it there. And they went and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We confess together our Christian faith using the words of the Nicene. 
I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things, visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated for the hymn number 719, I Leave All Things to God's Direction.
of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The writer of Ecclesiastes wrote, Long ago there is a time for everything. Time to be born, and a time to die. Time to plant, and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill, and a time to heal. A time to break down, and a time to build up. A time to weep, and a time to laugh. A time to mourn, and a time to dance. Lent finds its place in the beautiful rhythm that we call the church year as a time to reflect, to repent, to, pat, to fast, and to pray. It's a time to walk with our Lord Jesus Christ as he humbly moves toward the cross. Yet, as I said earlier, Lent doesn't leave us at Calvary on Good Friday. Lent leads us all the way to Easter, to the powerful victory of our Lord Jesus Christ over death and the grave. Despite its ashes, despite its dark pyramids, despite its reserved nature, Lent is a time of blessing. Because during Lent, we remember that, yes, we are dying with Christ, but we also remember that we will live with him when he returns in glory. This year, in our Lenten walk together with Christ, we'll meditate on the passion and death of our Lord Jesus has been recorded in Luke's Gospel. Each evening we'll move through one section of Luke, chapters 22 and 23, as we trace the last hours of Jesus before his crucifixion. This evening on Ash Wednesday, we begin our Lenten journey towards Easter with Jesus having a dangerous plot surrounding him. We often wonder when we hear all of these things how all of this could happen in the first place to someone like Jesus. Jesus, though, isn't the first to have evil return to him unjustly. Remember the story of Joseph, the story we just heard again, the very end of his story. Earlier in his life, he had been the favorite son of his father, Jacob. And his older brothers resented him for this. But his brothers' resentment grew to hatred, so they abused him. Evil. They sold him as a slave. Evil. They poured goat's blood on that special coat that his father had given to him, and then they took that coat to their father, and they lied to him that Joseph had been torn apart by wild animals. Evil. It was in slavery that Joseph's life had its ups and downs, and for a while it was mostly downs. But finally, through God's blessing, he rose to prominence in Egypt. God used Joseph's planning and wisdom to save many people from starving to death, including his own father and his brothers, who had done so much evil to him. Then Jacob, his father, dies in Egypt. Jacob's brothers are now afraid that Joseph is going to enact his revenge on them. But he doesn't. Instead, Joseph says something that references their history, something remarkable, something you might not expect in that situation. He says, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. Now, don't misunderstand Joseph's words. They did mean evil, and they did do evil against him. God didn't change that part. No, not at all. But God used the evil that they had done against Joseph for the larger purpose of which nobody knew what was going on except for God. Everyone was clueless about what God was doing. But God wasn't clueless. God never is. And he certainly wasn't clueless when it came to our Lord Jesus. In the passion of Jesus, all that we see in the Old Testament, everything that we see in Jesus' life and ministry leads up to this greater truth, these greater truths that we see God fulfilling in Christ. One of those truths is that Jesus is preparing for a greater Passover. Passover was a time that people remembered. They remembered that they were living under the thumb of Pharaoh and the power of evil and slavery in Egypt. After another Pharaoh had arisen, one who didn't remember Joseph or all that he had done, for the people of Egypt. Evil had come against Israel's descendants, and evil was done to them. 
Pharaoh and the gods of Egypt resisted God's people. Even though God sent plague after plague after plague through Moses and Aaron, Pharaoh's heart remained hard against God's people. He would change his mind, go back and forth. But finally, after the death of the firstborn, he let them go, only to change his mind again, to hunt them down and to chase them into the middle of the Red Sea. He had enslaved them in Egypt, and now he meant to destroy them. He meant evil, but God meant it for good. God saved Israel, and he defeated Pharaoh and all his hosts who would drown in the sea. God rescued his people, and as they stepped out onto dry land on their way to the promised land, they passed through death into life with their God. Their enemies meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. What God did at Passover long ago in Egypt and at the Red Sea, what God had done in all of Egypt with the plagues and the signs, God was doing now in an even greater way through his son, Jesus. That's the first truth that emerges from our reading in Luke 22. It's the time of Passover, but even more, it's a time for greater salvation, a greater deliverance, a greater movement into death, into life. Here's the second truth. Evil is coming against Jesus. Evil men of every sort plot against him to destroy him. But even more, Luke emphasizes for his readers that the evil one, Satan himself, is the driving force behind every plan to destroy Jesus. We look at the lineup of evil evil in these verses. In verse 2, the chief priests and the scribes were seeking to put him to death. They were supposed to guide the people into truth. They were supposed to tell them what Moses had passed down to them from the very mountain of God. But now they're looking for a way to put Jesus, the very word of God, to death. But it's not just them. Satan entered Judas called Iscariot. Satan. Satan, this one that Jesus had called the strong man who hates God and who wants to make all of God's people captive. Satan, who had bound a woman in illness for 18 years until Jesus healed her. Satan's minions who had possessed people from all over until Jesus sent 72 out to cast out the demons. Jesus said he saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Yes, Satan is a strong man, but Jesus is stronger. He is the stronger man who has come to defeat and to bind Satan. But for now, the evil one engages in battle against the Son of God. And Satan uses Judas. You know, we're so accustomed to this story, we know it so well, that we don't even feel anymore the shock and the tragedy. Judas, one of the twelve apostles, approached the chief priests and the scribes to betray Jesus for money. The evil was bad enough at the first Passover in Egypt. Now it's worse. Evil is coming, and it's coming for Jesus. But from this evil springs our third and final truth. Yes, there are human enemies, there is a human traitor, and there is a great supernatural enemy who are all allied together, whether they all know it or not, against Jesus. And yes, their plan is going to work better than they even hoped for, maybe even prayed for. The disciples of Jesus are going to abandon him. The crowd, too, will call out for his destruction on Friday morning. The third truth emerges when Luke emphasizes something else. Five different times, Luke tells us that everything is ready. Everything is prepared. The Lord Jesus has made the arrangements. He made sure that everything was ready, that everything was prepared for Passover, yes, but also for his passion and death. Jesus is ready. He's always ready. He's always prepared. He knows about the coming evil, about the abandonment and the coming distrust. 
And yet he knows that this is all happening according to the sure and certain plan of his father. Only in Luke do we hear Jesus' final words. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Words spoken 1,000 years earlier by King David. That's because, yes, evil is coming and it's going to do its worst. Sin and Satan will seem to rule the day. This is indeed, as Jesus said, the power of darkness. But Jesus is ready. God's plan, God's plan is for God to rescue and to redeem him. This is the greater rescue, a greater rescue than what Joseph did for his brothers. It's the greater exodus than what Moses performed with his staff at the Red Sea. Yes, all of Jesus' enemies mean evil for him, and they would accomplish what became the ultimate evil, the worst evil of all time. The Father meant it for good, and the greatest salvation of all would come. Jesus is ready to face the evil and to take it all on himself. And he knows that God the Father will raise him up from the dead and give him victory over sin and over Satan, a victory that will never end. Yes, everything is now ready. This last truth is the one that's especially hard for us to wrap our minds around. We know that God saved Jesus. But what about the evils that continue to plague all of us today? When we see, when we feel, when we experience all of these evils can lead to doubt creeping in. Does God really see us? Does God really care about us? Does God really have the power to save us? Is Jesus really ready to save the world ultimately from all this? How often does fear cripple us and deceive us into thinking that maybe God has been taken off guard, that he wasn't really ready for all of this evil this time. But he's ready. In this Lenten season, we will cast all our fears and our doubts on Jesus because he has undone all of sin and all of what the world has to offer and all of the power of the evil one. Jesus lives forever. And because he lives, nothing, nothing, will be able to separate us from God's love in our crucified and risen and ascended Lord. He's our Jesus, and he is ready. Christian faith is always holding on to God's promises and relying utterly on Jesus. But this Lent, we can pray that our faith will grow and that our grip on this promise will only tighten as we hold on to Jesus. We can pray that our mouths will be opened so that we can say to Satan and to every enemy, you cannot take God by surprise. Jesus is ready. He is ever ready to save and to redeem. You meant it for evil, but God means it for good. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Continue on page 290 with the service of corporate confession and absolution. Beloved in the Lord, it is our intention to receive the Holy Supper of our Lord Jesus Christ, in which he strengthens our faith by giving us his body to eat and his blood to drink. Therefore, it is proper that we diligently examine ourselves, as St. Paul urges us to do. For this holy sacrament has been instituted for the special comfort of those who are troubled because of their sin who humbly confess their sins, 
fear God's wrath, and hunger and thirst for righteousness. But when we examine our hearts and our consciences, we find nothing in us but sin and death, from which we are incapable of delivering ourselves. Therefore, our Lord Jesus Christ has had mercy on us. For our benefit he became man, so that he might fulfill for us the whole will and law of God, to deliver us, took upon our sin and the punishment that we deserve. Now, so that we may more confidently believe this and be strengthened in the faith and in holy living, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. It is as if, he said, I became man, and all that I do and suffer is for your good. As a pledge of this, I give you my body to eat. In the same way also he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Again, it is as if, he said, I have had mercy on you by taking on myself all of your iniquities. I give myself unto death, shedding my blood to obtain grace and the forgiveness of sins, and to comfort and establish the New Testament, which gives forgiveness and everlasting salvation. As a pledge of this, I give you my blood to drink. Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup, confidently believing the word and promise of Christ, dwells in Christ, and Christ in him, and has eternal life. We should also do this in remembrance of him, showing his death, that he was delivered for our offenses and raised for our justification. Giving him our most heartfelt thanks, we take up our cross and follow him, according to his commandment, love one another as he has loved us. For we are all one bread and one body, even as we are all partakers of this one bread and drink from this same cup. For just as the one cup is filled with wine of many grapes and one bread made from countless grains, so also we, being many, are one body in Christ. Because of him we love one another, not only in word, but in deed and truth. May the Almighty and merciful God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, by his Holy Spirit, accomplish this in us. Amen. Having heard the word of God, let us stand and confess our sins to him, imploring him for the sake of his Son, Jesus Christ, to grant us forgiveness. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death, of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. God be merciful to you and strengthen your faith. Do you believe that the forgiveness I speak is not my forgiveness, but God's? Yes. And let it be done for you as you believe. In the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Congregation may be seated for the distribution.
Now may this, the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in body and soul to life everlasting. Amen. Please stand for prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, we thank and praise you for feeding us the life-giving body and blood of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Send us your Holy Spirit, that having with our mouths received this holy sacrament, we may be able by faith to obtain and eternally enjoy your divine grace, the forgiveness of sins, unity with Christ, and life eternal. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Go in peace. Amen. May be seated for our closing hymn, number 418, O Lord, throughout these 40 days. Mm -hmm. 